Good morning, everybody. And a very warm welcome to you all that have braved the weather. It's not very nice out there, but it's lovely to see you all. And to anyone that's new or visiting, just a very warm welcome to you. This morning, we are celebrating harvest. And Bob was going to be talk, giving you the talk a bit later on. But poor Bob and Liz have contracted COVID. So thankfully, Susanna has stepped in at the last minute and helped us out. So thank you very much, Susanna. Thank you to Pamela and all the band, and to Michael and Richard on the tech desk. Thank you very much. And to Jenny, who will be reading a bit later on. So shall we just start with a, a welcome prayer? OK. Blessed are you, Lord God, creator of heaven and earth. Your words call all things into being, and the light of dawn awakens us to life. As we celebrate the gift of harvest, may we cherish and care for your good creation and offer to you the sacrifice of our lips, praising you, Father God, Son and Holy Ghost. And Jenny is going to bring us our reading. A reading from Joel, chapter 2. Verse 21, and this uh, is a reading after there had been a, a lot of um, locusts had been eating all the food. And, uh, Fields, do not be afraid, but be joyful and glad because of all the Lord has done for you. Animals, do not be afraid. The pastures are green and the trees bear their fruit, and there are plenty of figs and grapes. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice us at what the Lord your God has done for you. He has given you the right amount of autumn rain. He has poured down the winter rain for you and the spring rain as before. The threshing places will be full of corn. The pits beside the presses will overflow with wine and olive oil. I will give you back what you have lost in the years when swarms of locusts ate your crops. It was I who sent this army against you. Now you will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. You will praise the Lord your God who has done wonderful things for you. My people will never be despised again. Then Israel will know that I am amongst you and that I, the Lord, am your God and there is no other. My people will never be despised again. Amen. Well, it really is um, a joy to be here. A um, bit last minute, but it's really, it's really good. And obviously, we pray for Bob and others who are um, sick with COVID or other illnesses at this time. Um, but it is good to be celebrating harvest with you all today. Um, we had a little quiz for the children, and I thought we'd continue the quiz with some more questions that Bob has set us. Um, you know, we may need to report back. So um, here's some questions. This is one's about blueberries. How many tons of blueberries do we eat every year? This is an impossible question. <laughs> 60,000 tons. It's a lot of blueberries. I've got a blueberry bush in my garden and I think I have picked three blueberries this year. They were delicious, but there was not 60,000 tons, so I'm glad there were other people producing blueberries. And then this one is about insects. What insect species is most endangered in the UK and why? Bees, butterflies. <coughs> Apparently it is butterflies. And does anybody know why butterflies are the most endangered? Yeah, insecticides, the weather, climate change, destruction of habitats is a lot. Um, and often those are things that we don't think about. The very, the very small things that God created to help our systems to to work um, 
that the most vulnerable and fragile creatures are at risk because of our human actions. And then this is a rather unpleasant one as well. How much raw sewage was released into rivers and sea in 2023? Too much. This one is in hours, this statistic. 3.6 million hours of pumping raw sewage. So it really makes you think, doesn't it? I certainly, I love swimming in the sea. That's one of the things I really love doing. And uh, really makes me think now, do I really want to be, do I really want to be going in? And what does that mean for so much, <clears throat> so much else? And it was quite interesting, wasn't it, asking the children, you know, how does a potato get from being a potato to a bag of crisps? And they, they had gone sort of straight to the, the method, the cooking method, um, but hadn't really necessarily got that awareness of what's involved in the transport and the factories. And I mean, why should they? You just get a bag of crisps out of the cupboard. Um, so it's quite impressive that they actually knew what, you know how a potato got to be <laughs> to be crisps, but you know I don't I don't blame them at all because we often um, we don't think, do we? Um, often about how our food becomes our food. That you know I've really enjoyed having my allotment the past two years and getting back to basics and the joy of cooking a meal that comes solely or largely from the work of my hands on, on the allotment. But that's that's quite a new thing for me really to discover in a, in real terms and get my hands dirty um, because such is life that we don't live as we used to do in small fields in small villages with fields around us and you know the farms are getting bigger and more mechanized and it's all very different and I remember a few years ago I was um, some of you know I was used to do some work in China. And, um, you know, I was in big cities, but also sometimes I would go to these tiny, really sort of rural areas. And it felt like I was stepping back in time, seeing uh, farmers sort of thrash the wheat on the roads. And it was just absolutely fascinating, uh, like I was stepping back in time. And I'd never really seen anything like that before, but that sort of really brought it home to me how much um, the world has changed. And we know that... Um, themes around the harvest and caring for the land and agriculture is so key to many of uh, the things we read about in the Bible um, because of you know, the culture and the time uh, periods that the Bible was written in uh, but also so much of it makes sense Jesus told so many parables that were to do with the earth that were to do with living things the cycle of life um, and that's really interesting, I think, and reminds us of um, all that there is to learn from nature. And a little bit later on in the service, we'll be reading a lament for the earth, which recognises that even in the Old Testament, even all those years ago, all was not right. There was floods, there was drought and fire and pollution, and lots of the themes that we see today and the exploitation of Earth's riches are all part of that cycle of greed and wealth and creation, which we as humans have allowed to happen. And then we might think of the effect that the invasion of Ukraine and the disruption of the harvest and the worldwide distribution of wheat. And I think there are par parallels there with our reading today from Joel. And these prophecies in Joel were for the Jewish people living in Judah around, we don't know when really, but around uh, 500 years BC. And they had enjoyed being displaced and undergoing, undergoing great suffering. There'd been an invasion of locusts on the crops. And I was doing some reading about this last night. Um, and I read about three different commentaries and they all said different things. And some of them said, yes, this was definitely a real invasion of locusts. And other people were saying, no, it was metaphorical. It was actually something about military or it was something else or um, a spiritual thing. And so we don't know whether this was a literal or metaphorical invasion of locusts. But whatever it was, the people and their land 
had experienced much suffering. And not unlike that which happens to countries today affected by invasion and war and environmental disaster such as famine and flooding and pollution. But what we see in our reading from Joel is that God brings promise of restoration and kindness and healing and abundance. And um, I don't know how you feel when you read passages like that when we read in Joel, but I find it incredibly challenging to read those words of promise and abundance and to believe them for me and my community when I know that there is so much lack around the world. And so I've, in the past couple of days since then, I, I, I've known I was um, speaking with you, it, that's been something that I've been reflecting on and trying to marry those two things out, the promise of God's abundance and the reality of where we are in the earth at the moment. And then my thoughts turn to the words of um, a 16th century Carmelite nun called St. Teresa of Avila. And these are her words. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes, yours are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on the world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. And these words of Saint Teresa remind me that Jesus sent his disciples out into the world to share God's love in word and deed. And that is passed on to us as well. Being empowered by the Holy Spirit, we get to be part of the promise of God to see the land, the blessing on the land that we see rolled out in Joel. So we get to make decisions and actions for impact. So what are the things, the very real things that we can do as individuals when we feel that sense of overwhelm? So here are a few examples. Spread the word, start having conversations. We just started there to have a little brief conversation with the children, and I'm sure they, they probably get quite a bit of input at school about this, but thinking more broadly about the impact of how we live on the world. Start having conversations with each other. A few weeks ago, I was leading a meeting and I was just, I had so many bits of paper and I felt really awful. I was just handing out loads and loads of bits of paper. Um, and I thought, well, this is really good stuff that we're talking about this meeting, but I've had to hand out all these bits of paper to share information. Was there a different way that I could have done that? And actually I confronted that issue in the meeting that I had. And then things like campaigning and petitions and writing to our MPs, you know, things around pollution and um, the sewage in the seas and all, all these issues that we can feel passionate about, but what are we going to do with that passion? Are we going to speak to those in power and have our voice heard? Practical things around the home, like unplugging our appliances, it's so much easier just to leave everything plugged in, but it does make a difference. Use public transport or bikes or walking instead of using the car, whatever we can. Use, you know, cutting down on our plastic, eating less meat, um, having a plant-based diet, intensive farming, all of that you know, results in the use of antibiotics and destruction of the rainforest, burning the very trees that capture excess carbon. So they can be difficult choices to make, and we might think it's a bit wacko, uh, but they have very real consequences. Eating local produce, our food comes wrapped in plastic that pollutes the planet. And as we talked about with the crisps, all that transport that's involved, and if we're starting to eat local produce and cutting back on that, that travel and that excess packaging, 
then that can only be a good thing. So there are lots of things that we might consider doing and not all of them are going to be possible for us because of our own health limitations, our own financial limitations, but there will be some things that each of us can do to a certain level. Uh, Proverbs 27, 12 says, Sensible people will see trouble coming and avoid it, but an unthinking person will walk right into it and regret it later. I think that's a you know, word to the wise, really, about how um, you know, we have all these warnings about climate change. How seriously do we actually take them in our own individual lives? And then as a church... What is Mats and Baptist doing as a church, as a collective? And I've got a little note here from, from Bob, which I'm going to read out. As many of you know, we distribute on Tuesdays and Saturdays to the people of Matson. And the food is often overpackaged, overordered, and in need of a good home. At a rough estimate, we distribute over £40,000 worth of food a year. Without our involvement, it would go into landfill or to the incinerator. What a waste. It's been estimated that worldwide, one third of all food produce is waste. And yet millions of children go to bed hungry. So, could you join the band of volunteers who help to distribute food and engage with the people of Matson at the same time? I'll leave that with you. And then another opportunity um, would be to support the Gloucester Food Bank, which is where our produce uh, we've, we've brought in today is going to go. Now, I'm going to ask Jamie a few questions. Jamie, if you can come up, I will grab the other microphone. Hi, Jamie. Good to meet you. <laughs> So, tell us a bit about the food bank. Who runs the food bank? Um, so, I'm representing the food bank as a trustee. Um, we have a board of trustees. We've got a handful of paid staff, only a few. And then we rely heavily on just under 100 volunteers in the week um, to pack, um, work in the warehouse, drivers, distribution. So, yeah, that's the hub. Great, thank you. And how many people does the food bank help each year? Um, last year it was about 17,000 parcels that we sent out, and it's um, hundreds in a week. That's what's the no loan. Well, thank you. And where do uh, the food bank get the food and money from? Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> There's never enough, and we're actually in our reserves at the moment. Um, it's uh, uh, supermarket food drops. Um, you'll see those baskets in the supermarket. Um, it's donations, it's churches and communities. Um, we've actually doing a drive at the moment where we're asking local schools for their harvest contributions to come to the food bank because a lot of people don't know that we exist or they assume that it's coming to us and it's not. You know, you have to put your name in the hat and say, please, can we... Can we take that to donate to you know families in crisis um yeah so a lot of fundraising events that we do just to build awareness but mainly it's the donations of um yeah us <laughs> and um do you have any particular needs at the moment of things you're short on that you would appreciate there's always sort of shortages um but it is all dried Good, so it is tins, cereal, uh, we need custard <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> We're fine for baked beans and pasta and rice, but we need custard and a lot of sanitary products. Sometimes if I'm packing a parcel and it says razors, you know, basic things for hygiene, sanitary towels, um, you know, you go to the particular crate and there's nothing in there. Um, so that would have come through the warehouse as well. So that means we don't even have them in our warehouse. So sometimes sanitary towels, uh, razors, toothpaste, toothbrushes, nappies, a formula, um, you know, because there are a lot of children on our um, list that need those basic things. And finally, Jamie, what is your role at the Gloucester Food Bank? <laughs> well, I did the food bank um, 
volunteer. I started there volunteering. Um, I was in need myself a few years back when I lived in Hersham, and I went to my local church and they helped me. Um, so I just felt like I needed to sort of give back and get under the skin of the food bank and just understand what the need is and what, how it gets to the need. Because people would look at me and go, well, you've, how did you ever need a food bank? You're in a six-bedroom house, blah, blah, blah. No, it's anybody can be a month away or a domestic abuse situation away from needing that. Um, so I've taken upon myself to get onto the board of trustees and help the, the governance and responsibilities sort of leading the, um, the charity. Um, and volunteer every Thursday with my lovely Chris and Rachel. We're the Thursday morning team. Apparently we're the dream team. <laughs> um, yeah, and then fundraising, going out to the supermarkets or going to the Gloucester Day and doing the march just to make awareness. We're actually doing a, we're 20 years old next year, so we're doing a 2020, thinking about ideas at the moment to help raise awareness and to create the sort of fundraising and the appeal to keep donating. Because um, it is hard, a lot of people don't realise just one tin of custard can make all the difference. Um, so yeah, well, that's why I do volunteer and um, on the board. Lovely, thank you very much, Jamie. It's been uh, really great to hear about. I'm sure um, she'd be very happy to speak to anybody that got any questions later. So, yeah, that was, that was really interesting, wasn't it, to hear about the very practical um, things that are happening within our community. So I'm just going to, um, you know, with, with all that in mind of what we've heard about this morning, I'm just going to reread a couple of um, a couple of verses from Joel. I just need to pick up my reading. <laughs> I'll read it out from the Bible. <laughs> so this is this is what God said to the people of Judah. I will give you back what you lost in the years when swarms of locusts ate your crops. It was I who sent this army against you. Now you will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. You will praise the Lord your God, who has done wonderful things for you. My people will never be despised again. And I think those are words that we can pray for those we care about near and far those God has given us a heart for, those who are most vulnerable in our world. So as we celebrate another harvest, we can give thanks for our food and our water and our clothing and our shelter, and also for another kind of harvest, which is friendship and God's love for us and one another. And I'm just going to hold a moment of silence. And in that silence, just ask us to sit and reflect and maybe ask God, what are the actions God is inviting us to take? Just you know, one or two things that we might be able to do differently. We can't do it all, but we might be able to do one or two things differently. Um, so just, just ask God to inspire you. With, with one or two small commitments about making a change. So loving God, we thank you for your challenge to us. We thank you for your care for the earth and your care for us. 
pray that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit as we seek to be your hands and feet in this earth. Amen. Um, I think Marion, you're going to come back up now. We, we're going to um, have a time of um, lament and prayer together. So I'll just grab the other mic. <clears throat> the lament will be on the screen. And um, right, if I will start with the first word, verse, and the um, all the writing in white. Then can you you read, please? Okay. The land cries out to you, O Lord. The beasts of the fields, the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea. For the earth is scorched with fire, the air polluted, and the waters choked with waste. The waters surge and the floods devastate the land. The water springs are silent and the streams run dry. The green places are a dry land where there is no water. The ground is exhausted. The land has become parched and the winds The holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a desolation. Let the earth open and let the wholeness and healing spring forth. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. You drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys stand so thick with corn that they laugh and sing. The land cries out to you, O Lord. And now we've got an act of commitment for the care of creation and after each section that says Lord hear us can you say Lord graciously hear us creator God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit who makes sustains and renews all things we pray that we may be awakened to to the beauty of the earth and rejoice in the wonder and diversity of creation in all its forms and wonders. We particularly thank you for the beauty of this rain garden and the rose garden, for the flowers and shrubs, for the water they conserve and the pollinators they sustain. We pray for all who pass by that they may be encouraged and blessed by what they see they might value your creation more dearly and be inspired to play their part in protecting it. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord, graciously graciously hear us. us. Lord of life, as all things depend on the good quality of the air, the soil and water, may your wisdom guide us as we care for the environment. Deliver us from selfishness and rapacious greed. Help us to share the rich resources of this world gladly and justly in the cause of peace and stability between nations and people. We recognize that one of the first victims of war is the natural environment, and we pray for peace in Ukraine and Israel and Gaza. 
influence governments and lawmakers to not only say the right things, but to do the right things. Help us to change our culture, to live more simply, that others may simply live. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord of mercy, we bring before you areas affected by chronic shortage of water and pray for those suffering as a result of drought or the lack of safe water to drink. We pray for those suffering from the effects of extreme weather and the environment that has been damaged by cyclones, floods or destructive wildfires. May we better understand the effects of the changing patterns of weather on our planet. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord, graciously hear us. Lord of abundant life, we give thanks for the rich harvest of the seas. May we cherish the good things that you have created and be successful in reducing the pollution in our oceans, rivers and lakes, that life may flourish. May your wisdom help us to maintain the biodiversity of our fragile planet, strengthen and resolve and bless those seeking to protect the marine environment, animals, insects and plant life that are threatened with extinction. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord of the universe, you have made us from the stuff of the earth and to the earth we shall return. As we celebrate harvest, we thank you for the work of food producers, the farmers, the custodians, the end of your landscape. May we all tread lightly upon this earth, using renewable energy and green technology to live sustainably. We pray for the work of Gloucester Food Bank, for all who struggle to put food on the table, We bring before you the current situations, the rising cost of energy for warm spaces like Renew One and Toddlers. We pray for a change of heart within our government, not to water down our response to climate change, but to lead us in a green revolution. Creator God, hear our prayers and strengthen us to serve you in our care of creation. Amen. So as we go out from this place, um, I will reread those words of Teresa Avila for us. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. And let us close saying um, the grace with and to one another. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Don't forget there's tea and coffee in the hall.